Hi, and welcome to Piano Teaching Success Q&A. I'm Gillian Erskine, your host for today's show, as we join piano teachers from around the world to be inspired, uplifted, and make our job that little bit easier as we explore our passion for teaching piano. I just want to take 30 seconds to let you know that Paul and I are hosting our Accelerated Success 4-Day Teaching Challenge from the 1st to the 4th of June. We're going to be sharing our top five teaching strategies for motivating students to practice, how to get tons of progress, and ways to build those all important reading skills that are fun and every child can manage. Well, we can't wait to spend the week working with you on your piano teaching success. So click the link below in the show notes and register now. Well, today we are going to start our deep dive into the world of teaching students with learning disabilities. This is such a huge topic and one we know from the inpouring of messages and answers to our posts that teachers are working with every day in their studios. We've been overwhelmed by the generosity of our guests in sharing their expertise, ideas and experience to help you in your piano teaching. So today will be the first of three shows on teaching students with learning disabilities, both profound and subtle. And by subtle, I mean students who otherwise seem typical, but struggle to read. Those ones who lack focus and ability to sit still and just don't seem to progress well with our usual teaching strategies. You know the ones, the ones that are a little bit out of the box. Well, my business partner, Paul Might, is joining us today. Paul, you've been busy interviewing experts from around the world, but before we go into some of those interviews, can you share your own experience with teaching students you've had over the years? Sure. I've been teaching uh, for many years and I've had quite a number of children who could be on the spectrum and um, certainly two I remember very, very well. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm sure we've all had the... Um, ADHD kids. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, well I think um, what in your the a typical four day classroom has students moving around all the time. We go to the piano, up to the teacher's piano, back to your piano, up to the whiteboard, out to the floor, <laughs> back to your piano. So that kind of maybe worked in your favour. Absolutely, it? it certainly did. It made it it made it one interesting for well for all the students, but also it kept their attention all the time. So there was no opportunity for them to sort of wander off somewhere. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, I, and one of the things that we do in our in our photo classrooms is um, use, uh, use visual, auditory and kinesthetic ways of teaching every single thing we teach so that because we know that we've got a whole room full of uh, but this is a sh another show, I think. <laughs> we know we've got a whole room full of different learning styles in there. So we've always done um, everything three ways with three different sorts of, uh, for three different senses. So how do you think, do you think that's helped? Oh, absolutely. And those kids really, well, and every kid actually benefits from a multi-sensory experience. And those kids especially really enjoyed that multi-sensory experience. It was sometimes, um, I know one of them was particularly, uh, 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 loud sounds would become distressing for him mm. and um, but he would be quite happy to sing without any problem at all so we just had to be cautious about the sounds in the room so not too loud with the percussion instruments but again you know when he got into it he just loved it <laughs> mm, that's right and we call this type of teaching whole body learning and in the studio, our members have been playing around with whole body learning for a couple of months now. Shauna Hunter from Calgary in Canada has been one of those lovely studio members and she's been using whole body learning for students with learning difficulties. I asked her to share how it's um, going. I have several students with some learning difficulties. I have one who's dyslexic, uh, several who are uh, ADHD and one who is autistic and I've been using the whole body learning with them and it just has made a world of difference. My one little girl, she would come in, well, she's not that little, she's 11. 
but she just started taking lessons and most lessons if i'm being honest would end with her head on the keyboard and her saying this is too hard i just can't do it and so i discovered the whole body learning and we started doing some of that and the first day she walked in i says we're going to do something different today just sit on the bench and we're going to do some clapping and and we started this and she was looked at me like, really, are you sure? <laughs> I said, yeah, we're just gonna have some fun and do some rhythm. And then we put on the backing track with the clapping. And then I said, let's see if we can do this on the piano and play with the backing track. And she picked it up right away. I, I was amazed with how quickly she picked it up. And when she left that lesson, she was just beaming. She was so happy. Just, it was great. So we've, we've continued on with the whole body learning. Last lesson, I thought she's doing so well. I'm going to go back to just the, the paper and the notes and see how we do. And it was a disaster. We just, it was too much for her, I guess, <laughs> or, or it just didn't suit, suit her learning style. So we're, we're back with whole body learning again, and that just seems to really help it sink in for her and make sense to her. Well, one of the things I was surprised about was just how widespread learning um, children with learning challenges or students with learning challenges are. I guess I shouldn't have been because you only have to look at Facebook groups to see teachers throwing their hands up in the air with transfer students who can't read to gauge that there's a growing frustration and possibly growing number of students who struggle with learning piano through a replay approach, which they don't necessarily need to have um, a um, full on learning disability. Of course, they could just be a, a child who doesn't learn well from reading. So yeah, you, um, you spoke with Dr. Aaron Parks. Yes, from Ontario, Canada. And, you know, you might be surprised to know that 30% of the population has a learning challenge in one form or another. Welcome, Erin. Hi, thanks for having me. And you're a uh, special needs specialist and, you have, and the Lotus Centre specialises in working with children with special needs. So tell me your history about what you've done and how you got to start the Lotus Centre. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been I've been teaching for 25 years. And ever since I started teaching, I, I worked with, I mean, just like I think, like most teachers, students with different special needs came to my studio. And, um, you know, I found I, I, I really enjoyed it. I found it really, um, you know, fulfilling work in the sense that there, there was, um, there were like little puzzles to figure out. And it was such a, you know, reward when we kind of figured it out. Um, so I, you know, I had a bit of a knack for it and became the person in the studio that had all these students, but I wasn't really specializing in it, mm. um, for many years. I just, you know, taught the students as they came to me. Um, but in 2010, I was going to start my PhD in music education, still was not on my radar to specialize or that specializing in special music education was even a thing <laughs> that people did. Um, but at the same time that I was about to start my doctoral studies, my eldest son was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so, of course, as a parent, all of my attention went into researching autism. But at the same time, as a parent, I was finding it very difficult to find activities for him where the teachers understood he was four at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, just yeah, music lessons or martial arts or any of those things was mm. never a good fit, didn't work out. And at the same time, I was starting to look more into music, um, you know, and learning for students with autism specifically. Um, and just, you know, in my research, reading more and more about the potential there. And, you know, um, I could see it in my own child and also, you know, feeling as a parent that I would want a place to go where I knew that, first of all, they wanted to work with kids with, with special needs that, you know, they weren't going to, you know, be frustrated or, you know, anything like that, um, but also that they would know what they were doing that this yeah. was, you know, they understood and they would be able to do it. And so, you know, my personal and professional lives kind of collided into me seeing, you know, that there was a need 
for, mm -hmm. for something like the Lotus Center. And so the Lotus Center is a charitable organization that basically has a mission of providing access to music education for the special needs community. And so, you know, our mission is purposefully broad because we do a lot of activities to increase yeah. that access. So mm -hmm. we give music lessons. That's, you know, kind of the core. We have music camps all summer. We have camps, we have an after school program. But we also partner with different organizations with, you know, different orchestras or arts organizations to help them reach out to the special needs community. Um, we do professional development. We have an institute for professional development. I'm also a professor at the University of Ottawa where I teach courses in that. And those are all pieces to me of increasing accessibility. Um, we also do research. Um, so I'm a researcher. We partner with different, you know, research institutes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so right now we, you know, we have about 150 students that we see every week when we're not, when we're not, you know, shut down for, for COVID. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's when we first started, you know, almost 10 years ago, I saw a need, but I really didn't know, you know, there, there aren't centers like this. So I really didn't know how it was going to go, what the response would be. Um, but it's been overwhelming the need in the community and, and, you know, how Lotus Center has grown in these 10 years. Fantastic. I suppose there's a lot as a piano teacher, we see a lot of kids and sometimes we don't necessarily know whether they have uh, a special needs issue or a learning issue. And I, I was uh, watching one of your presentations and you said that around 30% of the population actually have some sort of learning challenge. Can you tell me more about that? Mm -hmm. and, and that's always a number that surprises people because it seems so high, but the important thing to note is that that's not necessarily saying that it's in the impaired range, like below the fifth percentile or anything like that. That is based on, so a diagnosis for um, a learning disability is usually based on a discrepancy from general functioning. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big issue actually for gifted children or people, adults as well, you know, that might be in the 95th or 99th or 99.9th percentile but are functioning in some areas at the 50th or 40th, which is fine. 50th percentile is average. It's not yeah. impaired. But when in every other area, they're way up here and there's something that's functioning way down here, there's a big discrepancy. And so, you know, it's important as teachers that we recognize that, you know, there are, there are going to be some areas for a good chunk of our student population that are not functioning as well rate. as others okay yeah. well and and uh you also mentioned that 80 percent of that 30 percent have issues around reading and language yes yeah and and a lot of that is visual spatial in particular right. which of course is vital for learning to read music <laughs> because yes. of the nature of, of music which I suppose if you know as a piano teacher if you had 20 to 40 students maybe so let's say you had 30 students and a third of your students had some sort of issue which is 10 of them and 80, eight of those 10 it's probably going to be around reading and you teach read play then you're going to have <laughs> Um, a significant percentage of your students that you're going to have some issues with with reading. Well, yeah. And I mean, think about it. Like whenever I'm in like a Facebook group or anything, how often do you see teachers saying, I have a student that's just not getting reading the notes? And, you know, yeah, it is. It's, it, it's a challenging concept for a lot of students. So even those students that the teacher is not identifying as having any special mm. needs, they're still identifying they're not getting it for some reason. Absolutely, you know. yes. Okay, so if 80% or of 30% have learning difficulties around reading in one form or another, we're looking at one in four of our students will struggle with a traditional read play approach. That's a lot, isn't it? You know, so what do we do about it? Let's see what ideas Erin has for us. 
you mentioned a whole heap of other things in your presentation. So memory, organization, reading rhythm, executive function, spatial awareness, visual perception, auditory perception. So many of those things are actually related to reading as well. And yes. So what's some of the strategies that you could offer um, piano teachers when you know, they're probably having a challenge with reading and irrespective of whether a child actually has dyslexia or ADHD or autism that might actually help the student. Well, exactly. And that's a good point of, you know, like it's these, any strategies, you know, are not limited to if you have a student with dyslexia, do this. I think it's if you see that a student is not getting it, in the way that you're delivering and then change. It's good, you know, I've I've really built up my toolkit in kind of having to solve these problems that I apply to all my students now. And I would say, you know, to me, there are two big things. Number one, I think that, you know, there's a lot of room for going outside of that traditional approach of, you know, teaching through reading. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying to remove reading, um, I think reading, reading music is a very important skill. And if you, you know, yes. your student can do that, then you should be teaching that. But it doesn't need to be the primary pathway. There exactly. are lots of ways to get there, right? And that's the great thing about music is it is a multimodal art, you know, so there are, you can teach kinesthetically more, you know, through movement. There's lots of ways to do that. You can teach orally. You know, I think the important thing is to recognize each student's preferred pathway there yes. and the second part for me is incorporating um you know different modalities even within each of those so even if you're teaching reading don't be afraid to you know use colors or um you know get a big staff that you lay on the floor and move around on it you know you're still working on the reading part but maybe you know again meeting that students the learning pathways that work best for them because really our job is to teach us well not just for us to teach our students but for our students to learn and I think often we just think of how we teach yes. and you know it's really important to look at each student and how they learn and for a lot of students you know however we teach them, they're, they're going to get it, even if it's not like, mm. you know, we all have that. I'm a visual learner or I'm an auditory learner. We all have our preferences. But if you have, you know, if you're functioning really well in all areas, you can kind of learn any way. But what? with that 30%, it's that not, you know, those 30%, there's a way that they're not going to learn mm. as efficiently. Mm. Mm. And all the research these days uh, is showing that the more, the more multi-sensory or multimodal the learning, the more effective the memory. And absolutely. Um, so, and doing things, I just read a little bit of research out of the US about changing things uh, ever so slightly, doing the same thing, but changing it so slightly, Im improved memory by something like 60% in terms of repetitive function, which obviously playing the piano is. And um, so it's just like, um, like playing a scale and then standing up and moving around and then playing it again, but playing it descending, you know? Um, and so like for scales, it could be playing, you know, playing up and down and then playing descending and then ascending. So just little changes can make a huge amount of difference, even playing in different octaves mm -hmm. and things like that. So those are really um, what, exactly what you're saying is like that multi-sensory and, and doing something in a different way that maybe can interest the student as well. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, but it also repeating concepts in different ways, you know, it reinforces if you do something, you know, like you're playing scales, but then you're also, um, I don't know, doing some sort of activity where you're doing movement, you know, mm. where you, you're tapping on different body parts for different, um, you know, tones in the scale or something like that. It, mm. It's just different ways of reinforcing those concepts. 
Such great ideas. Let's add to that with ideas from Karen Eastman, who is a piano teacher, who not only has extensive training in special needs, but Karen happens to have a lot of special needs students in her studio. Here's Karen to talk about the value of variety, flexibility, and having a toolkit of resources and activities at her fingertips to pivot at a moment's notice. Um, as a piano teacher, because of my, my very vast many years of Kodai training and my, my emphasis on all the ear training and the rhythmic training and singing and all of that, there's always something else in my toolkit that doesn't have to be piano, but it enhances mm. the piano skills when you get to the piano. You know, and these kids might walk in the door after a bad day at school and you may spend 15 minutes on the floor with rhythm sticks and whatever. But then, you know, you might say, is there a piano piece you want to play for me? And up they go to the piano. So you you, you hone them into a point of focus. Mm. They've forgotten about what happened outside that day because they're in your environment and they know you care. Mm. So I think, you know, as I said, when I started this journey with special needs children, I just worked on loving them. Oh, lovely the rest of it just went from there <laughs> <laughs> it's just so nice yeah well let's dive in and look at some of the learning difficulties and what strategies you use in your piano studio to help everyone have a successful le lesson <laughs> let's start with adhd what's the main struggle with adhd kids oh, they don't want to sit on the stool hmm. you know they want to walk around and and so i've been known to actually pick the stool up and put it over the side um yeah. Yeah. I know Mark Dan 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 does a bit of this with the younger ones because the, the whole balance thing is much better at the piano. You know, your little ones, they wriggle around anyway, even if they haven't got yeah, ADHD. They do. <laughs> so, yeah, and I do a lot of my group teaching with standing up. I get rid of the stool anyway. So I find, yeah, if you've got an ADHD student that's on the go, move, 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 which is often part of the problem, or they'll go over and look at a book on your shelf or whatever, yeah, get rid of the stool and do stuff at the piano standing up really makes a difference mm. and um the books i use like they have a, a lesson learning at the piano book then there's an activity book where we do clapping and ear training and then i i have like a theory book so i've got there's five books in the set of the ones i use so i've got you know you change the book and you grab the focus again and so it's having a whole heap of things available that you can change the focus when you lose the focus you can grab the focus back again so mm -hmm. that's um that's definitely with with the adhd do you do a use a visual lesson uh lesson plan like have with you know the those books maybe i don't know little images of them so that they know we're going to do this and we're going to do that or you just want that flexibility to be able to dive in no, and change they, sit, those, they, they come out into lesson they pull the books out their bag and they sit on my knee and i pull them out as i i go um ne never really in the same order because as mm -hmm. I said, it depends how the kid walks in the door. Mm -hmm. so and like you teaching groups, do you have any of these um, ADHD and autistic kids within a group with other I children? I do, depending on the child. And I do yeah. say to parents, I'm happy to start them in a group. But if the group's not the best place for them, as in their child is distracting the rest of the group, so other people, other students aren't getting yeah. value for money because I am a private business, um, or that their child is so distracted by the group, yeah. You know, I say to parents, we, we can assess it. So come into the group because group and socialising is really important for these kids because they've got to live in society later. Mm. But if if the group doesn't work, I say to the parent, we will go to individual. Mm. So I, I'm happy to start them. What kind of percentage are kind of successful in that? I mean, just I guess it would just depend on the on the child, yeah, every child, right? Number. It just really, this is the thing with these special needs kids. It's every child is so so different yeah and that's the thing we've always got to remember you can't read a book and think you're going to have an autistic kid walk in the room and you know um how you're going to deal with that child because yeah. you're not yeah <laughs> you, you've got to be flexible right you've got to be... add a chapter to that book you read you know? <laughs> um, but yeah flexibility you've got to be flexible and on the spot flexible like right now we need to do something else mm -hmm. and it sounds like you've really got to also have a bit of a toolkit of uh, I know I can go I can go here I can go here I could go here yes. you know like pull yes. out a game I can well I've got I've got lots of um from my, my days when I did lots of early childhood classes I've got set you know egg shakers and sticks yeah. and lots of percussion instruments um you know they're beautiful um xylophones sometimes just even doing um 
like you know just your dose so one five mm. one four five type accompaniments on that sort of thing so and they love that that's fun yeah 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 well it's fun for everybody every all of our children yeah. i love it too <laughs> i do too and i think i think my my goal is not so much how much can i teach a child it's how much can the child love music when they leave my room well we have the full length interview with karen coming up in part three of this series in the meantime let's talk about changing it up and teaching concepts in a variety of ways to make learning stick i'd like to introduce you to ashley hughes a second generation music therapist, so her mum must have been cutting edge at the time, I guess, from Florida in the USA. I'll let Ashley tell you her story. I'm, I have a private practice here in Daytona Beach, Florida, and we specialize in working with kids with disabilities, um, kids who have mental health challenges, um, and also people who have had traumatic brain injury, stroke, um, and also older people with dementia. So we have quite a retirement uh, kind of atmosphere in Florida. So we work a lot with people who have had stroke um, and things like that, in addition to doing typical music lessons with kids as well. So we do kind of a blend. Right. And you're a special needs specialist um, being a music therapist, but you're also a, a mom of a special needs child. Yeah, so I have a 10 year old son who is on the autism spectrum. He is high functioning, uh, but when he was very young, he didn't speak. He um, would elope and run away. So through a lot of early intervention and with music, we've come a long way. And so now he's considered high functioning. So yes, so I worked as a therapist before I had him actually, mm -hmm. um, and then became a special needs mom. And I'm also a therapist too. So I get both sides <laughs> of that perspective. I, I can imagine. And um, what would you recommend to piano teachers if they suspect they might have a special needs child? Yeah, so uh, sometimes when you work with kids, you notice that maybe they're not not the same or not progressing the same. I think, you know, the biggest thing I could say is thank you to all the teachers out there who give kids like ours a chance. Um, sometimes you might not have access to music therapy in your area. And, you know, what a shame that a child wouldn't have a chance at music. So, um, you know, my best advice is to um, make real small goals for your students, um, you know, maybe just finding three black keys together, two black keys together, you know, just break it down a lot simpler. I love to use these little cards that have um, just letters on it and have them match the letters, you know? Mm -hmm. So just breaking it down a lot more and maybe not having a, a, as high of an expectation as you would for a typical student mm -hmm. and just don't give up, you know, give them a chance to learn each concept, you know, make it a game, make it um, a rhythm with a drum. Um, you know, make it engaging because everyone can learn to play piano. We have kids in our studio that do not talk, that are nonverbal, who play and read and play both hands piano. So just, you know, give our kids a chance, you know, and listen to the parent, you know, the parent will be able to tell you about their child and how you can help them. Um, you know, maybe something that motivates them, you know, let's do this song first. And then, you know, some, whatever motivates them, you know, yeah. or maybe you do five tasks and then, you know, they get a sticker or something. Um, you got to find kind of what motivates that child and how to work with them and how to break it down mm. really really simple for them and to not give up that's an important part <laughs> and i i know that you uh, do a lot of speech and language work with students and um so i suppose is singing really important as well so what's interesting about live music is that it's located in all parts of your brain speech is only located in one part. So if somebody has autism, a stroke, a traumatic brain injury, they most likely won't be able to talk, but they'll be able to sing. And because it's stored in all parts of your brain, you can sing when you can't talk. Sort of like when you see a dementia patient who does, can't recognize anyone, but they can sing familiar songs. Mm -hmm. It's the same idea. So no matter what part of your brain is affected, music can help bridge the gap from the music part of the brain 
back to the speech part so people can either begin to speak or they can relearn how to use their speech and communication skills again. Brilliant. And so in terms of teaching um, children with special needs or children that you may, that may be undiagnosed as well, um, using singing and movement, uh, things that you would recommend? Absolutely. And, you know, you think back when you're a kiddo and you learn the ABCs, you learn the state song, you learn um, here, you know, you might learn a song about the Pledge of Allegiance or your times tables, you know, things that will help you remember academic skills. And you think about it, you can never forget those songs. And that's because it has such a strong storage in your brain. So the way that you can help your students remember things is to put it to a song. So a little example that I give, so I like to use piano pronto um, and their style, instead of counting one, two, three, four, they have a saying for each note value. So like for a whole note, it's hold this long note. For a half note, it's hold it. Um, a quarter note's play, play, play. And an eighth note's quick, quick. So I made up a song. Um, a whole note gets four beats, hold this long note. You know, you sing the whole song, but that's the end part of it. Mm -hmm. um, a half note gets two beats, hold it, hold it. Because if you're learning it in a song, you can't forget. So mm -hmm. then you can prompt your student and say, a whole note gets, mm -hmm. and it's going to come right out. And they're going to remember, oh, it's four beats. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so putting just little skills like that to piggyback songs, just little, you know, songs that kids are probably familiar with anyways, really simple songs. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to do. You'd be surprised. Such a great idea using piggyback songs. And if we look now to moving in the direction of dyslexia, Paul, you had a student with dyslexia, haven't you? I have. Um, I had one student who I didn't know was actually dyslexic and she did a grade one exam, a grade two exam. She got distinction and a credit. And then they actually moved to the country and um, her mum rang me about six months later and said, Kiara's just been diagnosed with dyslexia and her new piano teacher is trying to teach her by reading. And I, I said... <laughs> not going well <laughs> but I suppose that's not going very well and she said no I said have you actually told the piano teacher that <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so I hope that the piano teacher actually asked the parent or the parent actually told the piano teacher because you know parents are such a useful person in that um mm. uh in that sort of trio of teacher um, parent student and asking for help from a parent is often really great. Well, but also asking for ideas and because they're the one that is used to doing some work with them at home. They're usually doing quite a mm. lot of extra work and they can give you insights. And uh, Karen talks about that. Lydia talks about that. So yes, it's a really important part, isn't it? It is. It certainly is. And of course, she'd been learning in a whole body learning t situation. And I always find that the kids of her age which she would have been maybe nine or ten by that stage well they're only just starting to do beginner reading um, but I remember in class sort of going mm, you're not reading at all whereas some of the other children were starting to read and starting to take the concepts home but she was actually finding it very challenging when she was in class in terms of when we were doing reading activities. So doing I avoidance or just sort of coming. what was she doing? Avoidance? <laughs> Absolutely. Always avoidance. And it's <laughs> it's such a common thing that the kids avoid um, reading, especially when they've got a really good ear. Mm, she would have had a good ear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm. Well dyslexia is a learning difficulty that makes most of us think how on earth can I possibly teach someone the piano if they can't read? Well, to understand this condition more, I've invited friend, colleague and former software engineer, Alison Simpson from the UK, who has, who has dyslexia herself. And today she helps teachers who teach children with dyslexia in a school environment. I've never really been able to spell. I can't do E-L-L-E, -L -L -E. no idea. Vowels, no idea. I just, it could be any vowel really. Um, 
and I didn't do that well at school really considering how bright I have discovered I am um, <laughs> and, so, and you are so, right because you've gone on and studied physics oh uh, yeah and then you know yeah I've got a degree I, I can do maths I'm I'm fine with algebra um and uh, quite a lot of dyslexics are fine with algebra they can't do I mean I still count on my fingers and I'm better at my tables than I used to be but you know it's not great um and mental arithmetic there's just like yeah I know the two numbers but I can't do anything with them it's just like you can see the tumble where you, you obviously have found some coping strategies because you've gotten through a, a university degree yeah and I'm probably I'm, not and I'm doing a master's at the moment a master's so. right okay so we've got to do assignments we've got to be yeah. assessed yeah so how do we do so, that so dyslexia has nothing to do with intelligence it's just a your wired brains wired differently mm -hmm. um and I, you just develop what well, if you're re i have to as a specialist teacher assessor i have come to the conclusion that if you're reasonably bright you can work out your own coping strategies mm -hmm. so you know i always check before i leave anywhere that i um have got everything because i nearly once caused a bomb alert in harrods um, <laughs> okay tell us about that one <laughs> well i was at university met my parents for um afternoon tea and i left my handbag on the back of a chair so i now check everywhere that i you know I've anyone got could do that well yes but you know some people don't need to they just know they've got everything Oh, um, I think I fall into that. I could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> very good at locking myself out. Um, but it's funny, dyslexic children, students, they might forget, you know, their laptop or their bag or something, got their phone. So it's like motivation has a lot to do with what you can remember to do. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I was never going to be a teacher, was a software engineer, had my son, started helping in the local FE college, further education college. They had a course that you had to have a degree to do. Um, there was an awful lot of funding for dyslexia at the time in the 2000s mm -hmm. because our Minister of Education then had, um, well, he still has two sons who were dyslexic. And he, funnily enough, put a lot of money into dyslexia. So I have a dyslexia qualification and then I went on to get an assessing qualification as well and on that course the lady said no you're not dyslexic and I was thinking well you know it's like okay I tick that box on there all those boxes <laughs> yeah and then one of my colleagues when I was special educational needs coordinator did uh, it's called an assessment practicing certificate in the UK to be able to assess for adults going to university to get um exam concessions so extra time that kind of thing <clears throat> and I was her guinea pig and um so I'm dyspraxic with dyslexic traits so I I have all the like slow slowish processing weak auditory memory uh phonological difficulties yeah I, I don't know letters I do know letter sounds but vowels like I just said you know I have no idea um and that was when I was diagnosed. I was uh, mm, probably late 40s. Really? What, you got I'm all the way through to there with, without yeah. a diagnosis? What? Yeah. So I, uh, I'm of the generation that, you know, if you couldn't spell, you were thick. Amazing, right? She didn't really know she, until she was in her late 40s that she had dyslexia. We know... We know uh, which when students don't seem to pick up piano through reading very well, right? <laughs> well, Alison's gone on to achieve her grade five singing exam and understandably still struggles with reading music. And we'll hear more from Alison in part three of this series. Next week, my very special guest is Lydia Meem. Lydia is a clinical psychologist specialising in autism, 
and is across all elements of special needs students. Lydia also has personal experience with her son who has had some dyslexia or still has some dyslexia and dyspraxia. Here's a glimpse of what's in store for you next episode in part two. I am so excited about what we're going to share with everybody because there's some <laughs> really great stuff that we're going to do here. <laughs> but before we get started, let's look at the, the, the various different um, learning difficulties and what they are mm -hmm. because sometimes it can be it when I, even when I was when I was doing the research for this it's like oh I've got to get my head around how all yeah. of these things are different from each other so let's look at ADHD mm -hmm. yeah so attention mm -hmm. deficit hyperactivity disorder so you can have a couple of kinds so there's the inattention which is the dreamy floaty looking out the window kids that are getting distracted but they're not bouncing around the classroom and pulling everything off the cupboards and that kind of stuff. Um, they're just quietly uh, getting distracted and not noticing what's going on. And then when they go to do a test, there's nothing in there because they weren't paying attention at the time and it hasn't gone into their long-term memory. And they might've gotten distracted by an ant walking across the window or something. And, you know, that's what they remember from that lesson, not whatever you were trying to teach them. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the um, kids with the hyperactivity and impulsivity. So they're very easy to spot. Mm. Um, they're often very <laughs> fast. <laughs> you know, like, you yep. know them when you see them. <laughs> Lydia is so real and so much fun. And she has some awesome resources and ideas that you can use in your studio straight away to make your lessons go more smoothly. Well, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Erin Parks, Ashley Hughes, Karen Eastman, Alison Simpson, Lydia Meem, and Paul Myatt for sharing their experience with us today. We're going to be back in two weeks with part two of Learning Difficulties featuring clinical psychologist Lydia Meem. If you're watching us on YouTube, click that like and subscribe buttons now and make sure you're notified when our next episode of Q&A is released. Remember, as always, we love to receive your questions and ideas for future shows. I'd like to thank Paul who's been producing today's show and is responsible for all the videos and behind the scenes tech. On behalf of all of us, stay well and see you in two weeks.